Good morning, ladies. How are you doing this morning? I'm so excited to uh, be with you in Bible study and to be celebrating the birth, birth of our Lord Jesus Christ this month. And I hope that your heart will tune into His heart and that you will truly experience Christmas like you never have before. Uh, we're actually starting a new unit this, uh, this week uh, on When Emotions Rise. And, um, you know, as I've been thinking about this unit of study and, you know, I begin to think just how uh, timely it was because we have been walking through a whole year, I think, of uh, different emotions, uh, experiencing this emotion one day and that emotion the next day. And it's been a tough year for, for all of us emotionally. Uh, I looked up as I was doing my study, and as of December the 1st, uh, there has been almost 14 million COVID cases in the United States alone. Uh, and that's since January the 21st. There have been, in that number, 274,000 deaths. And there has been over 8 million who have recovered fully. And uh, sometimes I think that we can uh, train ourselves or our focus on those first two numbers, the number of COVID cases and the deaths from the COVID cases. And sometimes I think we let that other number go by the wayside. But that's the number we really need to look at and to rejoice and focus over is those 8 million who have fully recovered. Uh, most, uh, uh, you know, do not look at those numbers, they just look. And, and I think that sometimes we need to understand that we have to guide our emotions uh, to look at those things that are truth and, not, and, and the positive of the truth side. Um, you know, it is human nature to focus on the, ca the, the cases and the deaths, but, um, and, and, but we need to look at those that recovered and we need to end this year strong, I believe, uh, in knowing that uh, God has been at work in a remarkable way, uh, even in the midst of everything that we have gone through this year. COVID-19 has surely impacted us in many, many ways. It has impacted us physically. It has impacted us emotionally. It has impacted us socially uh, and economically. And then you add to that covid uh, the, the, uh, a total economic shutdown uh, like we have not experienced in my lifetime. Uh, we've gone through a presidential election that was like no other presidential election that I can remember. We've had political unrest and, and violence that was very destructive uh, to the landscape of uh, our country. And then we've had... Uh, uh, our law enforcement attack and many of them killed. And then you, you, for those of us who live on the Mississippi Gulf Coast, uh, we have had uh, the threats of hurricane. This has been a hurricane season of record numbers, 30 named storms just this year. So we've, we, like I said before, we've experienced a year like no other in the past uh, or in recent history. Uh, and then, you know, you add to that the just the regular stuff of life, uh, the loss of jobs, uh, divorce, uh, the loss of loved ones, uh, maybe a sickness, a diagnosis that you weren't even expecting and it came to you this year. Uh, and we can only say one thing when we think back over our uh, year is, Lord Jesus, just come. Just come, Lord Jesus. Uh, so many emotions experienced, and uh, it has been like we have been on the worst roller coaster ride of our lives. So what do we do with those emotions? Because I know I have had, uh, I've run the gamut with, with different emotions all year long. So what do we do with those emotions? Uh, how do we respond to the emotional things that we have been feeling over the course of of this year and our lives, you know. So as we make our way through this unit entitled, When Motions Rise, my prayer 
is that we will take away some very important truths and life lessons that will help us grow uh, in our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. As we enter this uh, Christmas season, uh, it is a very uh, festive time, joyous time, a time of celebration. But for some, it is going to be a uh, time of many firsts because perhaps you have lost a loved one this past year. Uh, and my prayer is that, you know, we will remember who brought us hope in the midst of our very dire situations. That is what, he, that is what Christmas is all about. And uh, there, even though there may be some empty chairs at your table, you need to focus in on what God does and how He wants to transform uh, your emotions into something very positive. Um, you know, when I stop and I think about the first Christmas, the world was in a far worse situation than we have experienced this year. There had been four years of total silence from God. 400 years. I can't even begin to imagine. It was a very dark time in the world. And then with the advent of the first Christmas, when the Christ child, when God sent the Christ child, there was again a renewed uh, feeling of hope, that there was hope and there was help. Uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, the, you know, so I want you to really focus on the positive aspects of all of those things that cause us to be so emotional uh, and, and the things that drag us down emotionally. So we're going to start with this week with our lesson on Psalms 116, and it is walking in grief. What do we do with the emotions when we're walking in grief? The writer of Psalms 116 knew personal grief, and you can feel it as you read this psalm. Though he didn't uh, ever identify the specifics of what he faced, uh, we know that it gripped him at the very core of his being. Uh, you know, and, and, and I want you to understand that grief doesn't just come because uh, of death. It comes over a strained relationship or, or a rebellious child or uh, the loss of a job or, or it can come over our health or it can even come over the fact that we've been isolated for an entire uh, year. Uh, so grief can be experienced on many different levels. Uh, you know, the things that I've grieved is, you know, um, Julie and I really enjoyed last year at this time when we were doing an Advent study. Uh, and we, you know, and I'm, enjoy, uh, I'm grieving over the fact that, you know, I don't have that this year. I don't ha have that experience with all my fellow uh, Christians. Um, and, and, and Wednesday nights and, and Sunday morning, we can't even uh, be together in a small group study right now. Not to mention the fact that we haven't seen LaRue's mom you know, in, uh, in, in a year now. And, and those are things that can bring us grief. So don't just think in terms of death, although uh, those are definitely times that we walk in grief. So the psalmist has much to teach us about handle the gr how to handle the grief we experience as we travel through this life. So turn with me in your copy of God's Word to Psalms 116. I love the Lord. For he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy because he turned his ear to me. I will call on him as long as I live. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the unwary. And when I was brought low, He saved me. Return to your rest, O soul. For the Lord has been good to you. For the Lord, for you, Lord, have delivered me from death. My eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. 
that I might walk before the Lord in the, in the land of the living. I trusted in the Lord when I said, I am greatly afflicted. In my alarm, I said, everyone is a liar. What shall I return to the Lord for all of his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all of his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. Truly, I am your servant, Lord. I serve you just as my mother did. You have freed me from my chains. I will sacrifice a thank offering to you and I will call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, Jerusalem. So that is the cry of the psalmist today. Uh, let me just give you a background. Psalms 113 through Psalms 118 are known as Egyptian uh, Hallels. Uh, Hallel just simply means praise Yahweh. And so uh, what we see here is one of those uh, Hallels where Yahweh is praised by the psalmist who had gone through great distress. They were written as praises and they were sung later in connection with the Passover meal and other Hebrew festivals. So I just want you to understand uh, that this is a song, and the psalmist was singing it. You can tell from the bottoms of uh, from the bottom of his heart. Actually, many scholars believe that uh, these six psalms uh, uh, were probably sung by Jesus and his disciples. Uh, on the night of his betrayal and arrest because that was the Passover feast. And, and during the Passover feast, the Hebrews sang this song. But, you know, I think it, I find it remarkable that our Lord God was probably singing this song understanding uh, that, you know, it was a prophetic uh, uh, triumph. It, it would be a prophetic triumph over the sharpness of the hour of passion that he would soon uh, experience. In verse 1, the psalmist is singing praise for the Yahweh. I love the Lord. He was looking back uh, to a past event, and like I said before, that he did not name in this psalm. Uh, and, and, and now it has become his public testimony uh, let me tell you what God has done. That is what this psalmist is saying to each of us. And, you know, it makes me stop and think, is that my default setting? Is that the default setting of my life that when I go through periods of distress and darkness and hopelessness and experience a, a, an array of emotions, do I praise the Lord God? Is that my default setting? Uh, what has God done for me in the midst? Because those are the things that, that I need to bring to the forefront of my life as a testimony like this psalmist did. Uh, what has the Lord done for us in the midst of our grief? And, and do, you under, do, do we actually understand uh, that true praise brings a testimony? And so when we're grateful for how God has brought us through difficult trials, there should be a praise that comes from, forth from our mouths uh, to the Lord God that people can understand. The psalmist's testimony is, uh, is that great, you know, the psalmist could probably tell us that, that having a great faith, being close to the Lord, does not insulate us from difficulty. But, you know, we all have a choice as to how we respond to our grief. Now, now don't hear me saying this. I'm not going to try to talk you out of your grief because I think that grief is real. And I think that, you know, it is not a sin to grieve that which we have lost, be it a person or whatever that might be, a way of life like we've known it this year. But grieving is a process, and we must work through it to get to, get, to find healing, to be able to issue a praise, uh, a testimony for others. But grief is a process. I mean, and to begin with, there's just the shock and, and, and the denial that, that, that comes with that grief. 
And then as we work our way through it, we begin to feel the pain uh, and maybe some guilt. What could I have done differently? Uh, And then there may even be some anger toward God uh, in the midst of your grief. And then depression sets in. And then as you work through the process of grief, you begin to accept what has happened. And when you accept what has happened, reconstruction can begin. Picking up the pieces of your life and allowing the Lord God to put your life back in order. So don't hear me saying that you should not grieve because that is a process that, that uh, is real and we need, to, we need to work through it. The psalmist, you can tell, knew grief here. He, he said that he cried out to the Lord in the midst of his grief. You know, and he not only cried out to the Lord, he said uh, in uh, verse 1 that God heard his cry for mercy. Uh, and, 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 and I want you to understand that God always hears our cries to him. And it said, he turned his ear toward me. He not, God, the Lord God not only heard the psalmist cry, but he listened. Y'all know that, that there is a difference between um, hearing and listening. Listening requires us to really go one step further and empathize with someone in their situation. And the psalmist, was, was, his testimony was one that God not only heard him, but God listened to him. Listen to his heart's cry. And then he begins to tell a little bit about his experience with whatever it was that he went through. And and, and the picture that he paints here, I don't know if you can identify with it, but I can identify with it. In verse 3, he says, The cords of death entangled me. That's, That's a very vivid picture of how he felt during his grief. And then he said, The anguish of the grave came over me. In other words, what he's saying is the grave just, it it was such grief that it just swallowed him up. He said, I was overcome by distress and sorrow. What an accurate picture that is of extreme grief. Uh, When I see those words, cords of death, uh, entangle me, that's almost like it's it's a total helplessness a total hopelessness. How am I ever going to get past this to the next thing in my life? Actually, when it, when it talks about the anguish of the grave, that word grave is translated in, in some of your translations perhaps as shio. Uh, and that word appears uh, for, for the grave uh, over 60 times in the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament poetry, death or sheo, when you see those two words, are aggressive words. And I think that's good for us to understand because sometimes we can can just uh, wax over the anguish of the grave and and, and, and not truly understand what the the psalmist is, is communicating. He's talking about this, his situation was an aggressive, clutching um, at the living. That, that's what he said, that the, de- that, that the grave was clutching at, the, at him uh, to waste away. And that, 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 is, the, that is the picture of, of the grave and Sheol uh, in uh, the Old Testament. It crushes. When you see those words, you are crushed with despondency. And I don't know if you've ever been there or experienced that, but I sure have. And so the the singer's plight, you know, apparently was a very desperate uh, plight at this time, uh, the psalmist was. And we don't know if it was an illness. We don't know if it was uh, someone had wounded him tremendously, a disillusioning experience. We don't know. But like Job's experience, you know, it well could have been both of those things together or a whole group of things together, just like in Job's experience. So perhaps, you know, uh, when the, the Lord God was, was singing this as he was making his way to the cross with his disciples and, and he was celebrating the Passover, you know, uh, 
Apparently he was thinking about the cords of death that was going to entangle him, about the anguish of the grave that he would endure, about the distress and the sorrow, the extreme sorrow that would be experienced uh, as he walked his way to the cross. Uh, I don't know what our Lord God was was thinking, but I can't help but think that this psalm would have had to have a, a very upfront uh, position in his life and in his thoughts as he was headed to the grave. In verse 4, the psalmist's cry was, after he talks about the cords of death and the anguish of death and the distress and the sorrows, then in verse 4, he, he just simply cries out and says, Lord, save me, save me. The psalmist knew exactly where to take his grief. And, and girls, I want you to understand that grief causes us to do a, 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 a many different things uh, in, as we try to work ourselves through. It causes us to just to, to withdraw, to, to just turn away from any help, any hope out there and just... Um, just remove yourself from life, from life. And the psalmist is trying to tell us that is not the way to work yourself through grief. That is not the understanding that we as, as God's people uh, should have. Although those are very real feelings, we need to work through them and understand that God is our help. God is our hope. God is the only one who can get us through uh, these times. I mean, look, look at what he did. He delivered his cross straight to God. He said, Lord, do you deliver your cry of your heart straight to the Lord? And, 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 and you can feel that he deeply, that this was something that he deeply felt as he cried out and said, save me. He, and, and, and by saying those, he was, he was directly stating the need that he had, that he wanted the Lord to help him deal with. Uh, he took his grief directly to the Lord. And then when we get to verses 5 through 9, we see a different psalmist. He is now, uh, his heart is overflowing with gratitude for, for God's attention to his suffering and his cries for help. In verse 6, when he talks about uh, the Lord protects the unwary, uh, that implies the writer's plight was not like anything he had known. It just came out of nowhere and, was totally, uh, and it was totally unexpected. And he said, the, God, the Lord God protects us when those, when those things happen. I mean, we can relate to that very easily. Things can be going uh, very well. And then all of a sudden we get that one phone call that totally turns our world upside down. But the psalmist is saying that even when those things hit us, that we totally unexpected when we, uh, when we awakened in the morning, we can know that God protects us uh, in the midst of those. Uh, when we are faced with a challenge unknown before, we need to take those challenges straight to the Lord because He will protect us through and get us safely through to the other side. He was not left in His hopelessness. He knew where His help came from. He knew that God loved Him. Do you know that today? Do you know that with any shadow of, of unbelief on top of that? I believe that, that our testimonies of praise from our deep troubles and the things that we go through should cause a flow of action in our lives. Listen to verse 9. Okay, because of what the psalmist had been through and because of what God had done in the midst of what the psalmist had been through, there was a flow, there was an action uh, that was a part of his experience in this. And in verse 9, he says, uh, uh, he talks about in verse 8 that the Lord had delivered him. And then he says that the Lord delivered him that I may walk before the Lord in the land of living. Understand that the psalmist knew because of what God had done in his life, 
that he had a responsibility to walk before the Lord in the land of the living. And what that simply means is to be able to express his praise, to be a testimony, to put his faith into action as to what he experienced because of uh, what God had, had done from him. To walk before the Lord is, is just like where the New Testament uh, says to walk in light. Those are the things that, that we need to do in order uh, for our testimony to go forth in praise and honor of God. Spurgeon once said, By man's walk, by a man's walk is understood his way of life. Some men live only as in the sight of their fellow men, having regard to human judgment and opinion. But listen to this, girls. The truly gracious man considers the presence of God and acts under the influence of his all-observing eye. We have to understand that, that um, you know, our walk uh, is understood by our way of life. And if we have praise and testimony as our way of life, no matter what we go through, and that we understand that we want God to be watching over us and not men, then we get what, what Spurgeon is talking about. In verses 15 through 17, the psalmist goes on and he says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His faithful servants. You know, I don't, I, I don't know, but apparently the psalmist felt like he was close to death at some point and that God was faithful to him even in the midst. Actually, verse 15 is an often a quoted verse uh, at funerals. And it reminds us that not only is God faithful to us in life, but He's faithful to us in the death. In death. And that's what the psalmist was trying to say. It doesn't matter what your experience is, whether you go on and you get through this and you live, or whether this takes you in to the very presence of the Lord, God is with you. And we have, we have reason to be uh, thankful and praise with Him. You know, just as sure as He knew that God had saved Him, He knew that uh, uh, God would show compassion when death came. And... Uh, you know, God not only sees the struggle of His people, but He knows the moment at each one of our deaths, and He says He is with us. Uh, it reminds me of an event in Stephen's life in uh, Acts chapter 7 and verse 55 when, when Stephen was being stoned. And right before his uh, death, uh, this is what the Scripture says. But Stephen full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God. Listen to this. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I have seen heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Often in Scripture we see where it says that Jesus would sit at the right hand of God. Here, Stephen sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Jesus wasn't sitting at the right hand of God at this moment, at this time of imminent death in Stephen's life. He was standing. And to me, there just conveys this idea that the Lord is concerned and He is even more uh, concerned over those that stand uh, in, the, in immediate uh, uh, death, and so he, you know, it causes him to move. Uh, I, I guess, so to speak, you know, no longer sitting but standing. But and this was what the psalmist was trying to convey to us. Uh, Boyce says, one of the scholars that I read under this week, God is particularly close to His people when they stand at death's door. God watches over His His children when they are sick or dying. And, and, you know, although He does not all intervene and He allows us to die, the Lord is with us. Praise the Lord and hallelujah is what the psalmist is trying to say. Uh, in verse 16, He is saying, uh, uh, You have freed me from my chains. 
Uh, that, is, that is a euphemism for deliverance. Whatever it had, had gone on in the psalmist's life, God had delivered him from it. And whether life through death, stop and think with me, God delivers us from the chains, from the chains that bound us, that hold us in bondage. And that the psalmist is, is declaring God's deliverance, you know. And however God chooses to respond, we should make the hard sacrifice to praise Him no matter what. In verse 17, uh, I love what the psalmist is saying. He said, I will sacrifice a thank offering to you uh, and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vow to the Lord uh, in the presence of all of His people. You know, if you go up and look at verse 12 uh, after the psalmist have, has been contemplating all that he went through and what God did for him, he says in verse 12, What shall I return to the Lord? Girls, you remember the, the leopards that, that went and God and Jesus healed them? Only one of those came back to thank the Lord. And the psalmist is saying, What shall I return to the Lord because what He has given me? Again, he says in verse 17, I will sacrifice a thank offering. I, I went and I actually looked up that thank offering because I really did not uh, or had forgotten exactly what that thank offering was all about. You know, it can actually be hard to be thankful in the midst of, of difficult circumstances that cause us grief. But the thank offering, and, and, and I will tell you, that when I went back and I did um, research, um, the thank offering was actually an optional offering under the law of Moses. There were five other offerings that the, the, the Hebrew people had to present at different times to, to God. But the thank offering was an optional uh, offering. And, uh, you know, the, and, and the psalmist is responding to God with a thankful heart and it reminds him, I will give you a thank offering. And it reminds me that, you know, we need to understand that uh, that thank offering is optional. But is it really optional if you are a child of God and you have experienced all that He has done for you? That thank offering was a blood sacrifice offering. And, and, and in a Leviticus... Uh, uh, um, in, in Leviticus, I think it's 22, I didn't write this down, in verse 29, this is what they're told about a thank offering. When you bring a thanksgiving offering to the Lord, sacrifice it properly so that you will be accepted. Eat the entire sacrificial lamb on the day it is presented. Do not leave any of it until the next morning. I am the Lord. Um, what do you offer the Lord, that is, that is a thank offering. Because we must understand that a thank offering was a sacrificial blood offering so that it, it, it had to cost something. God doesn't require it, but we should offer it before the Lord because of all that He has done for us. So what do you offer the Lord when you stop and you think about all the things that He has brought you through? What do you offer the Lord that is of sacrificial value for His steadfast work in your life? I mean, ladies, we've got to be thankful women. We've got to look at those hard times and we've got to shout with, with uh, loud voices just as the psalmist did that God is good, that He listens, that He, that, that, that he acts in the midst of the, the deep grief that we sometimes find ourselves walking through. I know the psalmist in Psalms 23 says, even though I walk through the shadow uh, of death, our proper response to those times of deep grief is to serve God sacrificially, that is something that is of sacrificial value that we can offer the Lord. To just say, it's no longer my life, God. It is your life. What do you want? And whatever you want, that is what I am willing to put out there before you. 
You know, we have to give ourselves some, some grace during the time of grief. But I also want to remind you of that quote from Spurgeon that I gave you at the beginning of the lesson. By man's walk is understood his life. Our actions must speak of how great our God is. You know, many great men of God have been shaped by their spirit, uh, not by their spiritual vi victories, but by their brokenness. Those times that they walked in grief, those times that they were truly broken because of situations around them. And I think that that is probably most of our lives is that we are shaped by those times of deep grief uh, that we can come out of and understand t tremendously how great our God is. You know, uh, Spurgeon uh, suffered from depression. So many sermons, so many great quotes, and, 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 and this was a man that, that suffered through deep depression. George Truett, uh, another man deeply devoted to God, was devastated and walked through grief when he accidentally killed his hunting partner uh, at a time in his life. Dwight Moody, Dwight L. Moody, was, was heartbroken and walked through extreme grief when his son abandoned his faith. Adrian Rogers lost an infant son. And we all know Horatio Spafford, when, because he wrote the, the, the hymn that we so love, It Is Well With My Soul. He wrote that after his four daughters died. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 tells us that in times of, of tragedy, in times of deep grief, we learn that God's grace will always be sufficient. So I don't know where you are or where you may be in, in, in your walk through, grace, uh, through grief, but let me understand and, and, and let us understand that as the psalmist said in 116, we have a testimony. There is a, an action because we know there are those times that we would never get through apart from the Lord God. Can we pray? Father God, I just thank you for the hard times. Because the hard times are the times where we, we truly lean into you. The hard times is where we come out of knowing that we can truly trust you. The hard times are the times that make us spiritually strong. The hard times are those times that, that you give us that we have a testimony to share with another. I pray, Father, that, that you will not waste any of our grief but that you will use it, Father, that we might glorify you and offer our thanksgiving to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.